What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Midwest Outdoors podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and this is brought to you by Fish Daddy. Hey, it's been a short two weeks, it seems like. Everything's bussing outside. We've got hunting season getting ready. We just had the dove opener here in Illinois. And at the start of the Midwest, the top, I should say, they're already starting in their fall pattern. And at the bottom, they're still pretty much in the middle of summer phase. So you got a lot of in-between going on. But I figured we'd start it up in the north and come down. We didn't have any records this week. And the tournaments are on a pause right now, besides a muskie tournament, but we're gonna get into that a little more at our main interview today. Although there's no tournament results this week, we do have a Bassmaster Open coming to the Midwest next weekend. That's right, if you're anywhere located near La Crosse, Wisconsin, the Bassmaster Open stop number eight is going to be on the Mississippi River. It'll be a great event. You'll see a lot of smallmouth and largemouth wade in and see some of the rising stars. So if you're in the area, go check that out. But we do have a couple great fishing reports to get to. People have been catching them all over, whether it's panfish, bass, or muskie. So we're going to kick it off right over the border around the Lake Geneva area with our buddy Mike. Hey, it is that time we're going to kick off the show with some fishing reports. And we got my buddy, Big Mike here. I met Mike down at ICAST, but uh, lo and behold, we didn't have to go all the way down to Florida to meet because he fishes some of the spots I fish the most just north of the border here and uh, haven't been able to get out much in the last month, Mike. So I had to call you and see what's going on up there. What's going on? Oh, not too much. It's been a pretty busy summer. Um, ever since ICAST, been doing a lot of uh, walleye tournaments in the Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay area. Yeah. I'm like Michigan, and when I get some free time to myself, we like to hit up Lake Geneva for some for some bass and smallies. Absolutely. Believe it or not, I've got the uh, National Freshwater Spear Fishing Championships on Lake Geneva coming up. Oh, so. nice. Yeah, so nice. Uh, we've been doing some scouting out there. You know, it's... um. It's an unbelievable lake when you get under the water to see what's in that lake. I mean, to be in such a big metropolitan area right between Chicago and Milwaukee, um, to have giant musky, big walleye, big bass, big panfish. I mean, really, the lake has it all. Well, yeah, if, if you don't mind battling the thousands of rock bass that you get uh, every other cast, yeah, it's awesome. For sure. We're going to take some of those out during the spearfishing. Of, um, <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Good to hear. Um, but what's the bite been out been like out there on uh, Lake Geneva? Well, uh, lately, uh, what we've been doing is we've been starting out the the mornings when the lake is kind of still glass before all the pleasure boats come out. Uh, we started with uh, top water or jerk baits, mm -hmm. and typically we've been getting a lot of smallies to to chase jerk baits, even even in the deeper water. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a lot of activity on the surface in the morning and they're just, you know, they're chasing baits. Yeah. So we've, we've had a lot of luck on some flukes and some different kinds of jerk baits. Uh, that's been what's producing the best in the early morning. And then once the sun comes out and the people start coming out with the boats, <laughs> um, then we tend out to go. Right. So then we tend to, to push out quite a bit deeper, uh, looking for some deeper structure. Okay. which has been working well. Nice, nice. Um, any colors seem to be doing better than others right now? Um, I'm, I'm partial to the green pumpkin, um, spe especially in, in Lake Geneva being so clear. Um, yeah. You know, natural. the more natural, the better. Um, but, you know, some buddies have had luck on crazy colors for this lake, like a morning dawn, which is kind of like a pinkish purple. Sure. Sure. Um but I guess my confidence color would be like a green pumpkin or a watermelon candy or something like that. Greens, browns, purples. Naturals in that really clear water. If you've never been to Lake Geneva, guys, the water can be, um, before the boats start churning it all up, you know, it can be 10, 15 feet, maybe more of visibility some days. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very, very clean. It's a very awesome, awesome fishery. Um, usually, if you can find some deep structure, some some pods of bait, you're you're gonna catch them. 
for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, something I don't know as much about is catching walleye out on the big lake. You know, I know um, we'll probably talk about this more next show in the fishing reports, but the king salmon have started trickling in now. And, uh, you know, that's that's one of my favorite things is to catch the salmon and trout that are running now. But um, a little further north up the state in Wisconsin, you've been catching some walleye. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah. So I'm a part of uh, Sheboygan Walleye Club and the last uh, few tournaments we've had have been in the Sturgeon Bay area. Um, and it's, it's a walleye series. So sure. um, typically the program up there could change by the minute. Mm. Um, but with the warmer weather that we've been having uh, recently, it's been more of a, a slower presentation bite. Um, so we've been we've been throwing slow death rig jigs. Uh, we've been uh, trolling crawler harnesses. Um, you know, some some colors work better than others in this presentation. Um, for us, the purple and chartreuse were were kind of kind of the key. But then, you know, some people were getting them on white. Some people were getting them on you know blues and reds. So it's all over the board, but. Um, as far as pitching the slow death jigs, I mean, there's a little bit of controversy as of late because, uh, that's more of your front facing sonar presentation, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, you, we, we find them on the live scope and, you know, you make a cast and you kind of, it's, it's almost like ice fishing, um, real slow, get it in front of their face and, and usually they'll bite. I mean, if you don't have the live scope in that presentation, it's pretty pretty tough to get them because you're kind of going in blind. And if you're not in the right place um, in the column, you're just not going to get them. Yeah, a lot of those fish are suspended. Um, what are you dropping down to them? Artificial, night crawler, leech this time of year? Um, it, it's mainly crawlers. Yep. Especially with the uh, harnesses. Yep. Um you know, they've been anywhere right on top of the reefs or right on right on the side. Um, depending on, you know, wind direction and wind speed, they could be all over this reef. And there's, you know, there's reefs that go over a mile long. So it's it's a tough bite. I mean, but those big trophy ones that everyone are are chasing, I mean, they're there, you know, and they're they're biting. It's just it's just a matter of finding them. Oh, it's you know. You know, we're just getting out of that summer phase. Those nights are just starting to drop. Um, I think once we start getting a few more cold nights in a row, then maybe we'll start seeing those big, long 30-inch girls start to put some weight back on, and uh, they'll start feeding better and better as the season goes on, I'd think. Oh, yeah, for sure. And and some some different baits we'll, we'll be able to use again. You know, we'll get back into to the jerk baits, the... Um, hair jigs and the blade baits yep. and all those fun things like we would in the spring. Um, and we'll get away from, from that slower uh, presentation style baits. I'm really it's not my favorite, but <laughs> I got to do what I got to do. I know. I know it's a little painful, you know, um, you know, I'm about to get up to Minnesota here and we'll be, uh, we'll be drop shotting a lot. I know. And again, that's not one of my favorite things. A little huh. bit slow. But when you get a good fish, I'll tell you what, anyone can anyone can make fun of, you know, it's called the fairy wand I've been called, you know, but hey, put a spinning rod in my hand. And everyone who used to not like forward facing, so, or excuse me, people who used to not be big spinning rod guys, now with the advancements of forward facing sonar, I think, um, and it shows on the retail side, a lot more spinning rods and reels have been bought this year than ever than the last like 15, 20 years. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So I think that shows you there's a change in time a little bit. You know, there's there's definitely some more finesse um, and precise um, techniques you can use with that spinner rod. Oh, for sure. And I mean, when I'm bass fishing, even walleye fishing, I mean, the drop shot kills, even on, especially on those real tough days. Um, when I'm bass fishing, I mean, I, I prefer to drop shot all time, all time of the year. Uh, I prefer not to, 
you know, do the chunk and wind and pound shorelines. But I mean, there's a time and place for everything. And I get it. You know, if someone had a bacon cheeseburger just hovering right in front of my face, you know, like right in front of me, I'd have to just, you know, take a bite. Right. Of it, you know, I mean, <laughs> right. Exactly. And you get that bait off the ground a little bit right in that strike zone, right in the fish's face. Game over. Oh, yeah. Well, Mike, if someone wanted to check out uh, what you're doing and 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 follow you, where uh, where can they check your stuff out? Perfect. Um, on Instagram, you could go uh, Mike underscore Steinke underscore fishing. Yep. And on Facebook, it's just M Steinke seven two. That is the line cutters pro, Mister Mike up in Southeast Wisconsin. Hey, Mike, we'll get together soon, buddy. Uh, tight lines and keep on them fish, all right? Sounds good. Thanks, Jim. All right, buddy. We'll see you later. See you later. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Welcome back, everyone, and wanted to say a big thanks to Mike. Now I don't have to do as much scouting when we go back out there because we know what they're biting on. But hey, we're going to take a quick skip over the big lake and head over to southwest Michigan where Pete gives us an insight on what's going on in southwest Michigan's bass bite right now. All righty, and like I said, we're jumping over to the east side of the lake now and meeting up with Pete Johnson. Little little information before I let Pete talk here. Um, Pete, I ran into him um, actually filming some content for the first podcast um, that we ever did, and um, he was more than willing to help me out, and I, you know, it was a great. It was a great help, honestly, and we got a lot of good shots. Um, unfortunately, I messed up the audio on a few things, you know, not my, that was my first time, but you know, we've done a few since, um, <laughs> but, um, Pete and winner of the ice fishing package, you get that ice fishing package yet, Pete? I did. Now I'm just waiting for ice. If we ever get it. Oh, well. <laughs> there you go. You got a new ice rod, you know, you got some, uh, got some new baits to get out there. Some fish daddy stuff, you know, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. Absolutely. So, Pete, uh, you were a high school angler when we met. You have since graduated. What are you doing now? Uh, I am at Southwestern Michigan College fishing for the team here. Uh, looking forward to my first first tournaments here come this fall. One on Kentucky Lake, one on Lake Darnell. Um, nice. Should be really fun. I fished a tournament on Darnell once, and it was the hottest day I've ever fished in my life. Um, I think I lost 10 pounds that day to catch yeah. one. I believe it. It's supposed to be hot, but that place sets up to a lot of my strengths. Um, I grew up fishing the Grand River a lot mm -hmm. back home, so current and grass always makes sense to me. Throwing a buzz bait, throwing a jig, flipping the grass, like it's all going to line up really well, especially even though it's going to be tough. I love when fishing gets tough because you're only one or two bites away at any given day. That's kind of how I feel about tough fishing. And us in the Midwest, um, I feel like we know a lot about tough fishing especially us that live in the metropolitan areas you know around this beautiful lake of lake michigan here but um you know we already talked about lake michigan a little bit we'll focus on some inland lakes over in southwest michigan that you've been fishing um where you've been lately and what's kind of been the bite and strategy going out man i've been to every single michigan lake it feels like in the last three days they're not there's not much to do down here at this time of year but uh fish and go to school um, so I've been to a lot of, you know, Portage and Clear and Paradise and Magician. Um, and then a lot of times they're still in their summer, they're still fishing like their summer fish. Um, I have not seen a complete fall migration yet. It's still hot. They're still getting a lot of hot, um, 
been catching them out of summer schools. Um, yeah, it's been frick, I ran over that, but it's been really fun. Um, still getting to see a lot of summer fish and a lot of big school and fish. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's fun this time because those big fish start getting bigger, you know, you catch them all through the summer after that post spawn and throughout the summer phase where they're uh, a little skinnier, you know, um, but something about that fall feed, they really start get going. Yeah. I'm waiting for them to get there. Those cold nights, every time we get a cold night, they push back themselves up and they'll get up shallow, but then, you know, we get two or three hot days and all of a sudden I'm finding the same schools again. Um, but I haven't seen it scatter those fish and I haven't seen them get that fall feed bag turned on yet. Um, really excited for that to happen though. I'm waiting. Some of these lakes I've been to, I'm like, dude, this place has got to be like insane in the fall. And I'm just keep checking, keep checking, keep checking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's frustrating. You know, mother nature has its own plan. I don't know about you guys, but here in Chicago, we had out like 101 last week. And then I think tomorrow night's going to be 39 degrees or two nights from now is going to be 39. So, I mean, um, a lot of change in this time of year for sure. Spring and fall, a lot of inconsistencies until it's consistent. But um, it seems like wet the seasons these days, fall and spring are shorter than ever. And it's kind of more winter and summer, you know? Yeah, no, it doesn't seem to be in between. I mean, take Labor Day weekend. That Saturday, I jumped in the lake one of the days and was wearing a hoodie the next. It's uh, It's been kind of crazy. Yeah, it has. What um what techniques what techniques have been using um have you been seeing more smallies or largies a mix of both or a lot of these lakes are tough to find brown ones I mean we've seen flashes of them we've we've seen like a school or two here or there um but it's a lot of the easiest most consistent pattern right now is chasing schools of largemouth on outside grass edges um and I've been doing it you sometimes you can get them to fire on a sea flash forty four cal um in bluegill color but a lot of times I've been catching a lot of big fish on a drop shot. Um, and I'll be honest, I've been scoping them. I know that's cheating, but, um, but a lot of times it's been a drop shot and a Demiki cause that's the only thing they'll eat. Um, but, but occasionally you'll get that wind to fire and they will eat a glide and they will eat a, eat a sea flash way down deep. For those who don't know, what's a sea flash? Uh, that is a deep diving crankbait, uh, made by Greg Mangus out of, I think it's out of this area of, of lakes is where he designed them. So there you go. Always, always fun to crank. You know, I think um, when people think grass lakes and Southeast Wisconsin or excuse me, Southwest Michigan, um, you don't think cranking as much because people like to crank off rock and wood, you know, but if you can get them crankbaits tipping that grass or right over or along that weed line, I mean, that's a bait a lot of people aren't throwing. So I'm sure those fish react to it really well. A hundred percent. And that's been huge this week is um, getting those fish that aren't necessarily committal fish to be able to react to something. Um, and that's where that crankbait has been the most effective tool for me. It is great to hear. Um, well, Hey Pete, just wanted to check in, see what's going on. Glad to hear if you want to catch some large mouth and probably I'm going to imagine in those uh, lakes, the pike are always biting too. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you throw a spinner bait on any, any grass edge, there will always be a pike or two around there. So. I've never experienced something like the Southwest Michigan lakes. Pike love spinnerbaits across the country, but only, only in Southwest Michigan, I feel like, do they love a Ned rig more than anything else. I have caught an unbelievable amount of Northern Pike on Ned rigs. I believe it. They love the light line. There's something about light line that they just like, and they always get their teeth in it every single time. You can't, ding. you can't. Yeah. Oh, it's just on, on beaten. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, breaking off on pike. We'll never get old. Starts getting old. You start buying hundred dollar glide baits, though, Pete. No, that's true. Um, twenty five pound big game mono, though. That's all. That's all that needs to be said. I haven't had a problem with that yet. So, there you go, everyone. If you don't want to throw a braid, the Pete Johnson endorsement of twenty five pound twenty five big game. Exactly. Exactly. Like I'm eighty million years old, but it works. So, hey, big game's great line. Use it for salmon fishing, Pete. There before we let you go. Um, if people want to check out what you're doing, where should they follow you at? Yeah, so I'm at P Johnson Fishing on Instagram. Um, same thing on Facebook. Um, and then I'm Pete Johnson Outdoors on YouTube. Um, you can check out my stuff that way. Very good. Well, Pete, um, good luck on your tournaments this year, buddy. And um, keep keep doing the Midwest Outdoors. Yes, sir. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Pete. Well, hey, we heard enough about bass and walleye. 
But we don't always feature the king of the freshwater, one of the biggest fish that swims around, one that I know very little about, but luckily there's plenty out there that know about it. We're gonna now sit down with Clayton Spice, who just won the recent musky tournament up in Minnesota, and he's going to tell us a little bit of not only the unique way he did it, but the surprising win that he took home that not only him, but all his competitors wouldn't have seen. All righty, hey, we are here during the tournament update. And since we got a, you know, a week away from the big bass events, we thought why not take it into the Midwest and talk a little PMTT action, those big toothy critters. We don't hear a whole lot from that side of things. And we have Mr. Clayton joining us, the most recent champ on tour. How are you doing, Clayton? I'm doing great. How are you doing? You know, not bad, not bad. I'm, uh, as always, I'm jealous. You know, you guys are out there fishing more. I feel like I'm here talking about fishing, but not getting to catch as many. Um, and when I see fish that win, you know, especially your guys' tournaments, musky tournaments, it's, um, there's something captivating about, you know, near 50 inch fish and stuff like that. I mean, um, I fish all the time and yet, they're still such so elusive, you know, I don't really target them. So for me, they're still really, really um, intriguing. They they're still intriguing to me. It's they're a pretty special fish. <laughs> they really are. And, you know, I we had this I had this debate this last week with one of my buddies who's a big musky guy. And I was like, you know, either the fly fishermen for trout or the musky guys. I don't know who believes they're like the most elite level of the fishermen but they're like they're like a different you know they're a niche group those guys yeah a little bit of a different breed kind of yeah. strange people we are <laughs> so speaking of being a little different you know i think we talk about here and so much national coverage about bass tournaments you know and the walleye tour starting to get more and more coverage um, but you don't hear a whole lot of things about musky fishing. Obviously, it's a little limited on where you can do in the country. You know, only so many states have them, really. Um, but give us a little information about um, what it's like to fish a musky tournament and what kind of some of the regulations are in that. Sure. But, and not to correct you or anything, but it's actually yeah. pretty amazing how many states have muskies. Um, they're all over out West. They stock a tiger musky, a hybrid musky, like in the mountain States and all the way down to Utah. I mean, you can fish them all the way back through, you know, the Dakotas and through the Midwest. And then you start heading out East and pretty much, you know, most of the States have them in either rivers or, or lakes or reservoirs out there. Yeah. Um, so they really are kind of all over the place, but they are, uh, a very elusive and for whatever reason, a very picky fish that um aren't necessarily easy to catch i think they call it consider it to be the fish of ten thousand casts you know so um to me um i don't know i could you know you're gonna have to just cut me off if i get off on a tangent but um there's something about chasing that premium fish the hardest one to catch out there on the water and you know the most elusive fish the king of our lakes basically um that makes it such a special fish um obviously something that is it's like christmas right there's something more special about it because it's only once a year if it was every month it wouldn't have such an appeal so when you have something that's in a limited quantity but always brings good emotions and a rush every time it happens something special about that yeah i've heard of you know you get people in the boat when they catch their first fish they you know they're hooting and hollering they're like that was just as good if not better than shooting my first ever buck so a lot of people consider it to that, which I think it's just as cool. And I mean, I get just as much of a thrill out of seeing somebody get their first fish as I do, you know, even more so than when I catch one myself, but it's yeah. just pretty awesome. You work your butt off. You probably throw some of the heavier baits of any inland, you know, fish out there, the heaviest gear. They're the hardest to fish for because of the gear that we're using for them. So it's so rewarding, you know, when you finally get that one in the bag. How's the shoulder feeling? You know, we're about halfway through the season. You know, I it's kind of funny because I keep thinking like, oh, my back, you know, eventually you'd think it'd get strong enough. It'd stop hurting or anything like that. But it's, yeah. you know, it always reminds, you know, pretty much every time I'm out there, it reminds me that, hey, my back, you know, it's still here and uh, it's still a little sore, but it's, it's crazy. 
all you got, all I got to do is just see a fish. You know, I don't even necessarily have to catch one, but as soon as I see one, you forget about all that back pain. And you know, then when you put one in the boat, it's like, you know, an adrenaline rush that sticks with you for hours and there's no more pain. It's just time to go again. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now in the tournaments, how, how do, how do you win? Obviously, um, the most, right. But is it most pounds, most inches? Um, how many fish are you allowed to score? Sure. Um, that's a great question. And, um, it's a lot different, I think, than the walleye and bass circuits. So we go off of total inches and in order for a fish to count, it's got to be at least 30 inches in most of our tournaments. There are a few still locally, um, here in Wisconsin that are still like 34 inches. Um, but somewhere between that, um, there's a couple tournaments, it could be 40 inches, but it's always by length. We don't weigh the fish because we don't keep them in the boat for longer than we absolutely have to. We're basically, we get it in a net and get it unhooked, get it revived. And then we pull it out and get a length measurement and then send in pictures of that and hold the fish and then release it. It's a trophy fish. So all our fish are getting released. We don't keep any of them and we can keep fishing and we can keep catching them until tournament hours are over with, unless for some reason the fish dies on us, like it's a deep hook or it gets stressed out and then the fish dies. And, um, we don't really have anybody out there patrolling, but there are, you know, in a tournament, there's other boats watching you. So it's very rare that we'll catch a fish and nobody sees us do it. So, you know, some people like just, you know, might try and just shove the fish away that isn't going to make it to keep fishing. But, you know, that comes down to a conscious thing. I don't, I would have a really hard time doing it every once in a while, a fish will die on us. And then, and then whoever caught that fish has to stop fishing for the day. Gotcha. And we have a team of two. So there's two anglers in the boat for every tournament, if you can, unless you're fishing by yourself, but I always fish with a partner. So then at least one of us can continue fishing, but I, I don't think knock on wood to this point, I haven't had any die on me during a tournament. So thankfully, obviously this time of year, you have to be really cautious of fish care. You know, um, the water temperature is higher. Um, when the fish comes out uh, into the air, their slime coat can uh, dry up a little faster. So what are the methods that you guys use to um, quickly, you know, get those fish in and out and get them unhooked and get them back and wait or not wait, but measured? So there's a few things that we do um, prior to catching a fish. And number one is to make sure you have the proper hookout tools close by so that you're not scrambling trying to find them once you get a fish in the net. Um, a very important thing to have would be to have a very large rubber coated net so that the fish, you know, it's big enough to hold any size fish that you could possibly catch in the water. And then once you get it in the net, leave the net in the water and the fish is able to swim upright and stay healthy. Now you mentioned something about warm water temps and you know, there's a big debate on that. There is every year. It seems like anytime that water starts getting up near the 80 degree mark seems to be kind of the common threshold to where, um, we should stop fishing for them just because it's, a uh, they're, they're kind of is, is big and as strong and powerful as these fish are. They're kind of um, wussies, I guess, when it comes to warm water. So they get a little fragile. Yeah, they're pretty fragile. They, uh, they get stressed out pretty fast. And, um, you know, we do see a lot of delayed mortality where people will fish. Actually, it's a lot of, I think, incidental catches, but people, you know, will catch them on accident or whatever. They don't know how to handle them. Yeah. Um, but so with that, you get a fish in the net and, uh, you get it unhooked as fast as possible, basically. And you get that bait out of the net. And then, um, if you got to measure the fish for a tournament or whatever, you'll have some form of a bump board or something. And, uh, it's good to wet that down first before pulling the fish out. Um, I wear finger tipless fish gloves. There's also like full finger, like full hand gloves or whatever that, yeah. um, are special gloves just for handling fish. It doesn't take the slime off of them quite as fast. And, um, I wear the gloves when I'm fishing, it kind of protects my hands from the sun. It also protects my hands from gill rake if a fish thrashes yep. and, um, in, so it also protects the slime on the fish. Hmm. Um, and then we'll, we'll keep that bump board nice and close to the floor or someplace close to where we're pulling it out of the net. So we don't have to carry it around. We're not walking around with it. We literally will get in there. We'll get the hold of the fish, hang on tight. We'll pull it out of the net. 
we'll either take a picture right away or we'll measure it quick and then take a quick picture. And then as fast as you can get it back over the side of the boat and in the water, you know, and upright, the better. And going back to your tournament this past week, tell us a little bit about what, what took the win and where were you guys at? Oh man. So we were on uh it was the third qualifier for that PMTT professional musky tournament trail. And, uh, as it turns out, we didn't have a fish in the trail yet. We've been kind of struggling. I've been, we've been having some boat issues, um, where we weren't able to fish, you know, all the qualifiers the whole time. And we just kind of all, all in all struggled. So we were going into this needing to catch a fish in order to qualify for the championship, which is coming up in September. Yep. Um, this is on a new body of water for us. We're in Minnesota on Lake Minnetonka, right in, you know, the twin cities, basically, you know, kind of, they call it Metro. Um, oh, that's H2 of fish daddy, our title sponsor here on the podcast. It's a new body of water for us, but it was kind of like a chain of lakes and it's set up similar to what a lot of the lakes that we fish back here in Northern Wisconsin. So, um, it wasn't anything that we felt we should struggle trying to find fish. although. Um, we really didn't find anything that we were looking for when we were pre-fishing. Well, we found a lot of structure. We didn't find the muskies. Yeah. And I was actually quite frustrated going into the tournament to the rules meeting the night before because everyone's chattering like the fish are going good. You know, they're biting really well and everyone's catching fish, a lot of small fish. But we found northerns and bass. You know, we were catching bass and I'm like waving at bass guys that have a tournament going on like, hey, you know, there's bass over here. I can see them and stuff, you know, trying to help them out. But as far as muskies were concerned, we were really struggling. So um, I wasn't in the greatest of moods and uh, going into day one in the morning, we had all sorts of problems again with my boat and trailer. I pulled into the launch. Uh, at some point I hit up something pothole or something and my brake caliper snapped off and was resting on my boat trailer on one of the you know, the wheels, it wore a groove in my wheel and caused all kinds of heat, which we kind of, I was like mad, but like shrug that off. Okay. Everyone has problems or whatever. So we'll fix that after the tournament day. So we launched the boat. It was still dark out. I went to put my back light in and here it overheated somehow got a surcharge of juice and melted the whole cover of the light into the light bulb, which fried it, smoked that. So I didn't have lights in the back, which is illegal and kind of dangerous so we're running around with you know a flashlight and uh again that's minor right you know we can still fish and everything so um we go to take off and we happen to be one of the farther launches away from ease out where the tournament was supposed to take off we had to drive all the way across Mintanka, which takes a while and uh my motor shut down on us we got up to about 40 miles an hour and all of a sudden it just shut down and like went into limp mode and right. now i'm really mad if i wasn't already um very stressed out and uh what had happened was a uh, roll pin for my trim had slipped fell out or something which caused my computer on my new motor my yamaha motor to show that my trim was all the way up even though i could trim up and down um it wouldn't let me go over a certain RPM. Our top speed was like 7.9 miles an hour. And as we mapped out the lake and it turned out we we're going to be about an hour and a half to get to ease out and tournament started in 45 minutes. So we almost went home. I turned around at one point and we, you know, talking to my partner and stuff. And he was like, you know, whatever you want to do, I support you. You know, I'm like, honestly, like all these things happening, like what else is going to go wrong? I, maybe we should just go home. Like, I don't know how we're going to fish this tournament. We got way too far to go. Our spots that we had to fish were too spread out. And um, we just weren't going to be able to do what we wanted to do. And uh, <clears throat> so, like, we sat there for a while, kind of still heading towards ease out, but, like, going really slow, just, like, I'm scratching my head, like, I don't know what to do. And, you know, we came to the conclusion that, hey, we paid for this entry fee, which is very expensive, and we're not going to get this money back just because I'm having motor problems. So um, we need to at least give it a try. So I called the tournament director and he, you know, told him, I was like, hey, we're going to be late. Um, do you mind sticking around or something? And I told him about how long <laughs> we were going to be. And he's like, well, I'm going to go have breakfast then after we're done letting all the other boats out. And then you just call me when you're close. We'll come back. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. So. It turns out we were about 45 minutes late for ease out. All the other boats were flying by us the other direction, kind of wondering what was going on with us because they saw our stickers on our motor. So they know, knew we were in the tournament. Plus, 
I know a lot of the people on the trail now from the years of fishing against them, you know, have made a lot of good friends. So got a lot of weird looks and stuff. Um, what we ended up doing was on our way over there, we realized that, Hey, we couldn't, you know, fish our spots. Like I said, so I felt like our best chance of catching a fish would be to put lines in the water and keep them in the water. Um, and then just drive around the lake and troll. Now you can cast or troll in, in these tournaments. Um, it's one line per person. So that doesn't really matter. Um, it was like a caster's bite. It seemed like out there pre-fishing and everybody that we talked to was casting. Nobody was trolling, but the way the lake sets up with these beautiful weed edges all around the whole lake, there's better spots, spot on the spots, different reefs and different points and bays and stuff that were better than others. But the entire lake was fishable as far as trolling. Like we could literally just put rods in the water and go all day and we could see a different part of the lake the entire time we'd never even have to go back over anything you know that we had already gone over it was big enough and vast enough so all right that was our um game plan and um we're not you know uh we ended up trolling blades which is also not very common i've seen people do it every once in a while i don't know of anybody that's been super successful in the tournament doing it but I've dabbled with it a little bit more recently. Um, really didn't know hundred percent what we were doing, um, but just kind of winged it and kind of. What size what, are we talking about? So the blades were, uh, it was a, actually, um, it was a nine ten, So a mag nine and mag 10 combo, like a tinsel blade. Okay. And it was one bait that caught all the fish. Um, no matter what else we put out there. I mean, we ran different stuff all day, you know, the, both day and a half or whatever that we fished. And that was, there was only one bait that got hit. It's made by my buddy, uh, Kyle Hunzader of uh, Hunzy Tales out of Green Bay. It was a banger, um, which is pretty special because he's gave us the first couple baits that he ever made to start testing up north and on the trail like four years ago. And we started catching fish on him right away and we tried to keep it a secret. And eventually he was like, you know, I kind of would like to go big with these. And I'm like, all right, we'll start promoting it. So the fact that we were able to catch fish on these bangers was pretty awesome. So we were trolling blades and we were trolling them off of planer boards. There might've been some other people trolling blades that's, you know, off and on throughout the tournament, but I don't know that I saw anybody using planer boards. What it did was the water was clear and it got us to get the baits a little further away from the boat. Yep. And we kept them extremely high on very short lines um, if the sun was out on day one, it was cloudy. If the sun was out, we would have probably seen every fish eat because our bait was very high in the water column. Um, so we get through ease out, we get set up, we start going, we catch a pike in the first five minutes. And I was like, well, we're not doing any worse than what we did pre-fishing. Cause that's all we could catch was pike. So we were like, oh, well, let's keep going. And, uh, I think it was about 45, 50 minutes in, we pop our first fish, um, hooked up. It was a big one. It ended up being our biggest one of the tournament. Um, and, uh, you know, what a turnaround as far as emotions and, you know, our mood and everything else we celebrated. I'm pretty sure anybody that was within a mile of us probably heard us after we released it because we were just hooting and hollering and hugging and high five. And, you know, like we qualified, we needed that one fish. So we qualified and basically we were like, well, no matter what happens from here, you know, let's jam some music let's drive around let's have fun Good. you know let's learn some of this lake if we ever got to come back here again we'll have you know just take notes drop waypoints just you know let's see this lake and let's see what you know it's capable of and uh turns out we got another one about 30 minutes later um the first one was 46 and a half the second one was 39 and three quarters and for those people who aren't familiar and want to know kind of how the points work um like i said you need a 30 incher to qualify yeah. So that's worth 14 points. And every quarter inch over that is worth another point. Gotcha. And then you get, I think you get like 10 more points for a clean release. So if the fish release is good and swims away, you know, you verify that with, you know, the tournament headquarters and they give you 10 more bonus points. So that's kind of how that works. So those are two very nice fish. Um, after the second one, we were, uh, you know, still really good spirited. We still weren't thinking about, even being able to compete 
you know, honestly, like we thought like, wow, if we could do this trolling, imagine the fish that everyone else is catching casting right now. Like everyone's probably hosing them. They're going to catch fifties. Like it's going to be insane, you know, whatever, but we were still happy. So we kept going. Um, we fished into an area that we had wanted to cast if we were able to cast and spent like three hours in this bay, I guess. Um, honestly, it was like a whole nother lake because the water clarity was completely different and uh nothing was going on in there and we saw guys come in and cast and leave you know we never really saw anybody get kind of fishy where they were doing extra figure eights or any crazy boat side stuff so we were starting to think that maybe that area had shut down completely so we like couldn't get out of there fast enough obviously we could only go so fast so it took us a while to get out of there um we got back out in the main lake and uh found another one at about 1 30 in the afternoon on day one and that was another 45 and a quarter and now we uh started scratching our heads thinking wow like that you know you can catch two fish and you can do pretty good you might get top 10 but when you get three fish um of that size 46 and a half 39 three quarters and 45 and a quarter um, I don't know of any tournaments that I've ever fished where that wasn't going to take top 10. So, um, now we are just like, wow, like we actually are competing. We have a shot at this. We maybe could, you know, place, you know, somewhere we could get a little money out of this, you know? And yeah, sure. so, um, obviously we are super stoked and, uh, we ended up going to the tournament headquarters after after day one and we found out that we we're in first place um we were very quiet about what we were doing i don't think anybody really had a clue because um you know nobody was really paying attention to me trolling around out behind them you know everyone was focused on casting and doing their own thing which was super nice um because we still pretty much had our pattern to ourselves coming into day two day two brought um sunny skies flat calm um, changed a little bit. We, I kind of thought maybe with that weather that the bite would change and our pattern might fall out. But I also thought, man, if we got three yesterday, you know, five hours, we got seven to one was our fishing time on day two on Saturday. You know, we should be able to get one more bite, right? You would think. Um, so we stuck with it. We decided we were going to ride or die, you know, we we're going for it and uh we never got another bite on day two at all not even a pike and we probably caught like eight to ten pike as well as the muskies on day one so um we were super nervous um nervous you know still happy about what we had done but we were nervous now that we were like wow like i i can't imagine we saw an update you know midway through day two um we saw that another team had tripled up that was down lower. We saw some of our other friends that had caught another very nice fish. So we were like, ah, we're getting bumped for sure. So we're at uh, the tournament central for, you know, the awards thing afterwards. And we're sweaty palm, just kind of like sitting there twitching just, and the names start getting read up and we start looking at the top 10. They start at 10 and work their way up and, you know, place after place after place fall and our fish are not being called. And we're just like, what is going on? Like, are you serious? And everyone, when we showed up there, we were late, obviously, because we were late to the meeting because, you know, without being able to drive fast across the lake, it took us a while to get off the lake. Um, but we walk in and everyone's like, oh, I think you did it, you know, because everyone talks. And supposedly, and like they were saying, nobody said anything about getting three or, you know, catching a fourth or, you know, anyone that was close to us doing really much better. So, so that kind of was like, gave us even more like excitement, like, wow, like, is this even possible? And then when they got to third place and they read the fish that were caught, um, I knew we were either first or second and we had a pretty good feeling that we were going to be in first place. And then second place, they listed the first fish and we knew right away that it wasn't us. And, uh, we started high five and yet still trying to cheer for the people that, you know, keep be respectful cheer for the people that got second place that's still you know awesome but um yeah hearing our fish get read off at you know in the first place position uh was pretty pretty amazing I've, that's our first big like money win we've won some other tournaments and we place in these quite a bit but we haven't won 
uh, PMTT event yet. So, well, hey, congrats on the big first win. Um, you're, you're now, you know, you're a winning tournament angler. You're pumping the brands, you know. Now you're letting the secret out the bag a little bit. Just keep yeah. a few to yourself, you know. Keep a few to yourself. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, but congratulations to you and your partner. Shout out. What's who's the partner? Uh, Nick Amrose. AKA the, the hammer. I got to say that because he makes his own baits as well. He makes a uh, custom wood baits, um, that he hand carves, hand paints, um, small batch, super small batch. And really the only time you can find them is at the Wausau Wisconsin Muskie Expo in March. He has a booth there. Um, and he showcases and sells his stuff there, but he makes, uh, glide baits, dive rise baits, um, some wooden jerk baits and uh, a vast, a big variety of like twitch baits and crank baits. So trolling up to like ripping twitch baits or whatever. So, well, hey, Hammer, when you're watching this, I'm a big bass glide bait guy, but I like them big enough that you, it looks like you can throw them for musky, you know? So, you know, just keep that in mind. That's all I'm saying. You know? We actually, he made a prototype like bass glider this year that we kind of played around with this spring a little bit. And it's, pretty sweet i think he's got to do a little more work on it before you know we can send that out to other people but uh yeah, yeah. I get it. Uh, we're building a swim bait too right now and it's there's steps you know there's there uh, is yep it's, it's a learning fun. process <laughs> well hey i want to say congrats to you guys thanks for joining and you do guide up there in northern wisconsin correct i do yep uh, my my business name is uh thistle do outdoor adventures it's a little spin off off of uh my grandparents business so my my great grandpa was one of the first musky guides up in the area um way way back before i was born and my grandpa um guided a little bit too um around his retirement years until he just realized that he just wanted to pan fish and you know walleye fish and stuff so that's where the business name comes from i have uh a youtube channel that just uh to kind of showcase some of the stuff that we do um some we'd make some lake of the woods trips and we kind of travel around and i try and film as much of the pmtt and stuff as i can um but do some guiding um you can find me on facebook under my name clayton spies uh instagram or you know the youtube channel and stuff but yeah i could give out my phone number too if you want me to but no, it's up to you yeah, so my phone number. If you want, if you want to get out, I got quite a few openings this fall yet. It's uh 715-891-1046. And uh yeah, love to get out. Let's go do some fishing. All right. Well, there you go. Clayton, before we let you go, if someone's going out musky fishing once we're getting a, a cool down this week, what mm -hmm. should they what would they be throwing up in your area? Uh, this time of the year when the water starts cooling down, if we get these cool mornings and stuff, the fish um, by us tend to slide up pretty shallow and um, we're getting them starting to get them pretty good on top water. Uh, actually still getting them on rubber. If you want to hop, you know, like shallow rubber through the weeds, um, that's been working really well. Blades have been hot and they've been really cold. I always like to have somebody starting off with one and we can usually tell right away if it's going to be working or not, you know, for the rest of the day. Um, it's been kind of hit or miss, um, but blades should be working really well right now. And as the water cools down and we can keep suckers alive, we'll start, you know, dragging some meat too a little bit, which is fun. All right. Well, Clayton, last question before I let you go. Scope or no scope? I use it, but I don't use it the way most people probably would that's a whole nother conversation i i use it for uh i have 360 imaging and i have mega live imaging and they are used primarily for structure fishing um we're fishing very high pressured fish and waters and these fish set up spot on the spot on like inside turns little points of weeds little pockets of weeds and i use these electronics really to find those spots before i get to them so I can, you know, help direct casts into the right areas. I'm not necessarily driving around sharpshooting. We can do it. It's not fun to me. Um, and I'm not going to say one way if I'm against or for it. I mean, I think there should be a limit to it. Um, as long as it's being used, you know, with respect to the fish and stuff, um, I'm, I'm for it. Well, everyone, that is Clayton. Check out his guide service. Good luck at the championship this fall. And uh, we'll you. talk to you later. 
All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Welcome back everyone. And I don't know about you guys, but every single conversation I have about these big dinosaur of a fish, I learn so much, you know? Um, it, it's interesting because I've spent, truthfully, about 25 years just focusing on these freshwater fish that swim around us. And on the south side of Chicago area, I'm not as fortunate to see a whole lot of muskie. There's a couple lakes that have them um, throughout my life. You know, I've only caught muskie while bass fishing. Uh, never once have I caught one while targeting them. So it's something that's really rare to me, which is rare itself because I feel like I know so much about these fish. But it's cool to keep learning about one that I don't know. And it's, it's, it's such a fish that's so humbling because even the best struggle to catch them and I think that's what makes the draw to musky fishing so special because you're never guaranteed anything. And the hope of every cast being that 10,000th cast, I think makes it so special. So special thanks to Clayton again for informing us and giving us the story of his improbable win last week. It was great to hear. Now we're gonna throw it over to Violet Tally for a tip to not only see more fish, but land more too. So when you have forward facing sonar, um, the way it's normally put on is it's put right on the shaft of the trolling motor. But what do you do when you, like the problem that I've had, is you have to use your trolling motor to adjust the boat, but you're fixated on a particular area or a particular fish or crib, whatever, with your active target too, but you have to move your trolling motor and adjust because the wind's blowing. So one of the things I went ahead and did is I teamed up with Live Scanner, and Live Scanner makes this motorized turret and it sits off from the trolling motor and allows you to control your active target too, independently of the trolling motor. You can use the remote controls or you can use their foot pedals. If you want more information, you can go to livescanner.com. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alrighty, everyone. Well, just like that, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the show. Fortunate for me, it's about time to hit the water. Now, I hope you guys catch plenty of fish this weekend. And to my hunters, I hope you start sighting in those scopes, start using those bows and putting those trail cameras up because it's gonna be season before you know it. Again, special thanks to everyone that puts the show together. A thanks to our guests we had on this week's show. Make sure to follow and like them on the social medias. Same with the show. If you haven't, make sure to follow and like and subscribe to us, guys. And until next time, tight lines. We'll see you guys on the water. Thank you.